Hello and welcome back to day two of Zoology Live from the Museum of Zoology. I'm Ros Wade, I'm the Learning Officer at the Museum and I'll be your guide on this wonderful week of wildlife. Did you miss day one? Well don't worry, it's available on YouTube and you can find out all about insects and snails and loads more there so it's really worth a watch. And please do remember to put your sightings onto our Zoology Live 2020 event on iRecord. We would really love to know what you're finding on your patch and this data can really help scientists as well better understand our local habitats. We have shows at 4pm every day this week where we'll be talking to experts about different types of local wildlife and we'll be sharing the results of all of our wildlife surveys and the challenges that we're setting through this week on Saturday. And it'll all be rounded off at 4 o'clock on Saturday with a great zoology live quiz, so do join us for that. Right, back to today's show. This is day two of our celebration of all things mini beast for National Insect Week. And today we are exploring insects in flight. We have a beautiful film by dragonfly expert Duncan McKay, but we're going to start off today with a film from our research assistant, Matt Hayes, all about butterflies. Remember, our experts will be talking to us live after their films, so do send in any questions, post them in the comments box on YouTube, or send them to us on social media using the hashtag Zoology Live. So let's go butterfly spotting with Matt. Hello everyone, my name is Matt Hayes and I'm a research assistant in the University Museum of Zoology in Cambridge. I study butterflies, so today I want to talk to you about some of their key features, some of the most common species that you are likely to see around you, and also then give you some hints and tips as to how you can support butterflies where you live. If you are only just beginning to look at some of the wildlife that lives around you and you're new to this, then butterflies are a perfect group to get started with. There's only around 60 species in the UK as opposed to about two and a half thousand species of moths so with butterflies there's not too many different species to get to grips with. What's more when trying to ID butterflies it's often just a case of saying what you see it can be quite simple. They are also a really great group uh, to go out and do field work with. They tend to really come out mainly in spring and summer between the hours of about 10 and 4 on warm sunny days and they avoid rain so it's perfect for you to go out and see them during this time and avoid all the bad weather. Let's start by taking a look at some key butterfly features. One thing that sets them apart is their wings. Their wings are large, opaque and often brightly coloured which is very different to the transparent see-through wings of most insects. Butterflies and moths belong to a group called Lepidoptera this scientific Latin name translates as scaly winged, with lepis or leopard meaning scale, and terra meaning wing. If you zoom in on a butterfly wing, you will see that it is indeed covered in thousands of tiny scales, many of which are brightly coloured and almost like pixels in a screen build up the brilliant butterfly wing patterns we see. Another key butterfly feature is their mouth part. They have a long straw-like mouth that is usually curled up beneath their head. They then unfurl it to extend into a flower and drink its nectar. This straw-like mouth is called a proboscis. Now you know the key features of butterflies, you can start to split them up into different groups known as families. Let's take a look at these different groups and some of the common species you are likely to see. Some of the best known butterfly species belong to a group called the aristocrats and are members of the family Nymphalidae. These include species like the peacock butterfly with its characteristic eye spots, the small tortoise shell, the comma with its ragged outline and white comma mark on its underwing, the red admiral, and the Painted Lady. Many of the butterflies from this group will commonly visit gardens. Lots of butterflies in this group are also long-lived, with adults of species like the peacock butterfly living nearly a full year, whereas for most butterfly species, adults only live a few days or weeks and spend the rest of their time as caterpillars or pupae. 
The peacock, small tortoiseshell and comma butterfly adults can even survive the winter by hunkering down in sheltered locations like sheds or tree hollows. They do this to avoid the frost and wait out the bad weather. You can see a peacock butterfly doing this here. If you are careful not to disturb them, you can search for them in dark corners of outhouses during the winter months. The Red Admiral and Painted Lady do not usually survive our cold winters, but actually migrate huge distances to our shores every year. They can travel from as far south as the Mediterranean and Sub-Saharan Africa respectively. With most species, adult numbers will dip once they have laid eggs and given rise to the next generation. But this means you can see their caterpillars instead, where they will be growing on selected food plants. Numbers of adult peacock butterflies tend to drop off a bit around mid-June for a month when the next generation is developing as caterpillars and the food plant they use are nettles and we've actually found some here. They gather together in large groups and they have this beautiful black colour with speckled white and they are lined with spines down the length of their body which helps protect them from predators. Peacock caterpillars aren't the only ones that use nettles. There's also small tortoise shells, red admirals and commas. And it's thought that actually about 40 other species of insects also feed on nettles. And then animals such as birds and frogs will eat the insects and also use nettles as a bit of a refuge themselves. So although for some people nettles have a reputation as maybe being a weed, they're actually one of the best things you can have in your garden for wildlife. So keeping a little sunny patch of nettles will go a long way. After a few weeks when the caterpillars have grown large enough, they will then form a chrysalis and undergo metamorphosis, transforming into a butterfly. I'll just put my thumb in frame here so you get a sense of scale for how big this beautifully camouflaged chrysalis really is. Let's take a look at another group of butterflies, the browns. This group also belongs to the family Nymphalidae, but for a long time was thought to be separate. These summer flying species are more commonly found in large areas of grasslands and meadows, but can still come and visit gardens. One of the most common species you are likely to see is the meadow brown, which can be found in grasslands across nearly all of the UK. If you go out searching for butterflies in meadows and grassland habitats, it can be a good idea to take a stick along with you to gently flush some of the species out. So things like meadow brown will be living in amongst grass tussocks and if you just gently wave the stick along in front of you, then it can cause some of them to fly out for you to see. And actually I can see it has worked. There's a meadow brown just here, which I'm gently flushing out with the stick. Not all of the browns live in grassland habitats though. As the name suggests, the speckled wood butterfly lives in dappled sunlight within woodland. Males are territorial and will defend patches of sunlight from intruders. If they encounter another male, they can perform amazing territorial spiral flights as the two males circle one another in competition. Another group of butterflies you will commonly see are the whites and yellows, which belong to the family Pyridae. The brimstone butterfly is another species that can overwinter as an adult, and is often the first butterfly species seen emerging in the spring. Males have a bright sulphur yellow colour, which is where it gets its name. As they emerge early and are long lived, brimstone butterflies benefit from having nectar sources available to them throughout the whole year. You can help by planting a range of flowers that bloom all the way through from spring to autumn so that no butterflies go hungry. Other common species of the family Pyridae are the small and large white butterflies. You may have heard them being called cabbage whites as their caterpillars use cabbages as their food plant. Sadly, this can cause conflict with vegetable growers, but why not grow a cabbage patch specifically for the butterflies to give them a safe place to lay their eggs? As the name suggests, the large white can grow a few centimetres larger than the small white and it has larger black markings on the edge of its wings. A final species of white butterfly to look out for is this one. Remember when I said you should just say what you see when identifying butterflies? Well, this butterfly has orange tips to its wings, so of course it's called an orange tip. 
This is a spring flying species that lays eggs on shaded garlic mustard. Females actually have black wing tips instead of orange, but both have beautiful green mossy underwings. Other butterflies you might see include those from the family Lycinidae, which contains the blues, coppers and hair streaks. Two species you are most likely to come across are the common blue and the holly blue, which can look very similar on the wing. However, when they land, the holly blue only has pale powder blue on its underwings, and the common blue has patches of white and orange. Another difference is that the common blue tends to fly close to the ground, whereas holly blues more readily fly up over bushes and trees. The final group to keep an eye out for are the skippers from family Hesperidae. This is the group of butterflies most closely related to moths. They are small and have an erratic zigzagged flight. When they rest, many species of skipper also hold their wings halfway between open and closed. Common similar looking species include the small and large skipper. As the name suggests, the large skipper is bigger, with slightly more brown mixed in with the golden orange of the wings. You now have the tools to identify some of the most common butterfly species in the UK and have learnt some ways to give them a helping hand. Remember, planting flowers all year round for them to feed on is a great way to attract them to your garden and planting their caterpillar food plant will help the next generation. And now I'm joined live by our butterfly expert, Matt Hayes. Hi, Matt. Hi, Rod. Hello. Um, that was a really fantastic film, and I feel like I've learned such a lot through watching it. Um, so what was it that first interested you about, about butterflies? So I was always the kid when I was little, running around with a bug pot and a magnifying glass. Um, so yeah, that's always been something I've been interested in from a very young age. And then I have a kind of vivid memory it's quite cliche, but of watching a David Asmerer documentary, as we all have, um, on uh, life in the undergrowth, which was kind of mid 2000s and was the first time technology had got to the state where we could actually film at the scale of insects and really get an insight into their behaviour. And he did a piece on the large blue butterfly, which has a crazy life cycle where um, its caterpillars are looked after by ants. And basically, the caterpillar tricks uh, the ants into. Uh, thinking that it is one of their own young and they pick it up and take it back to its nest and then they will raise it as their own when the caterpillar then eats the real young of the ants <laughs> um, and the ants are none the wiser so they think one of their young is doing really well and all the other uh, they should look after it whereas all the other young they have are disappearing and that just got me thinking that butterflies are clearly they have amazing behaviours and amazing things to study and since then yeah I've continued studying them until now really yeah, yeah. Oh, fantastic. It doesn't seem very grateful eating all your hosts. <laughs> I know, not the best guests yeah. really, are they? No, but, no. Uh, but fascinating behaviour and it works yeah. for them. So yeah. <laughs> it's like a cuckoo. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we've had a couple of questions come in. So mm -hmm. one of them, which links to that, what, what's your favourite butterfly? I mean, does the large blue count as a favourite, do you think? Or yeah, I nice? think it probably would. Yeah, mm -hmm. just because of that amazing behaviour. It's not what you'd expect from this kind of beautiful butterfly. It's got this this kind of I would say sort of sinister side, it's, it's not really sinister, it's just very clever. Um, and again, I think most people seeing a blue butterfly would never think it's got that interaction with ants, but it's truly an amazing behaviour. Um, and I say the Duke of Burgundy is one of my favourites, but um, Ed, my boss, took that yesterday as his favourite, so I'll, I'll stick with the, the large blue. We should start having a voting system, see which is the most popular exactly. animal. Yeah. <laughs> so a couple more questions. Uh, can you keep a butterfly as a pet? Do they make good pets? Yes, actually that's something I'm doing uh, at the moment. So one of the best mm. things you can do uh, is keep the caterpillars as a pet. Um, so um, there's a lot of guidance online if you're looking to do that, but the simple thing really is uh, if you do come across, as you saw in my uh, video, for example, the peacock caterpillars on nettles, yeah. if you do come across some caterpillars, make sure that you have access to the specific food plant that they are feeding on um, because they are quite particular in what they eat. So you can then keep those caterpillars in a kind of ventilated um, pot. I think the guidance is generally, do you remember those old uh, style kind of sweet pots which are really quite big and then you can put a hole in the top and that sort mm -hmm. of thing. Apparently that works really well. And yeah, as long as you keep them with a kind of a 
the fresh supply of the food plant you found them on and maybe spray them with some water, they'll get most of their water from the plant itself. But um, then they're really easy to keep. So you, and also they're not a huge time commitment if you're not sure about having, having an insect as a pet because they, um, they will generally feed for a few weeks, pupate into a chrysalis, and then you can actually then release the adults back into the wild as well, which is lovely. Um, so we're doing that at the moment with some peacock um, caterpillars and one turned into a chrysalis last night. So in a few weeks, oh, we'll that's exciting. It. Yeah. yeah, it's very exciting. So, um, I mean, that kind of brings me on to one of my questions, which is that caterpillars and butterflies are really, really different. Can you sort of explain a little bit of what's going on inside the chrysalis during that change? Definitely. Yeah, it is quite a dramatic change, isn't it? Um, because I think most people learn about, obviously, that a caterpillar turns into a butterfly from quite a young age. But I must admit, I, I was included in this, that I just sort of assumed a caterpillar grew wings. But it's, it's mm. far more dramatic than that. So once it's formed this protective casing, this chrysalis, and it starts to pupate, pupate and undergo metamorphosis, it actually releases enzymes which begin to digest its own body tissue. So what that means is it, it breaks down into clumps of cells. And if you were to cut open a chrysalis when it was undergoing metamorphosis, you'd almost get this sort of lumpy soup which would come out, which sounds crazy. Um, but then what happens is these, these lumps of cells then reform into the, the shape of an adult butterfly and then that re-emerges. Um, this is stuff that there's, there's research going on with this and more is getting discovered about this process um, currently because it is such an amazing thing that's going on there and it's such a strange process that there's a lot to be learned but yeah it's a very dramatic change imagine dissolving and reforming but when you become a from a child to an adult it'll be very strange <laughs> it sounds like something from science fiction doesn't it it's, uh, it's very, very really cool. does yeah yeah yeah. Uh, yeah insects always do things like that from science fiction it's really cool <laughs> so we've got a question from linton aged five and he'd like to know mm. um why butterflies have wings why butterflies have wings it's a very good mm. question so, because obviously caterpillars don't have wings. So if you, if you think about a caterpillar is laid on a specific food plant, uh, which the adult chooses for it, um, but the caterpillar then can't move very much to, to, to get a wing laid. So it's quite important for that adult butterfly to have wings for it to actually be able to move around. If it couldn't, it needs to be able to uh, fly away to find a mate and to find food sources and, um, and flowers and things to feed on. So if, if they couldn't, if they didn't have wings, then it would be really, really difficult for them to find to find a mate and keep the population of butterflies going. That's a really good question. Yeah, yeah. So we've got another, got quite a few questions coming up. So Martin says, my daughter Megan is doing the butterfly conservation survey on butterfly numbers. How many of these awesome. surveys do you do and how important are they? They're really important. Yeah, there's actually something coming up um, in mid-July for a few weeks called the, the Big Butterfly Count, which I would recommend if people um, haven't taken part in these sort of citizen science surveys a lot, then it's a really good place to get started. Um, if you type it on Google, there's, there's guidance on how to join in. It's quite simple. And it basically takes a few hours of your time in your garden looking at what butterflies um, are around. And it's great that she's getting involved with uh, butterfly surveys because the more people that we can get recording the wildlife they see around them, then the more data we have to figure out uh, how species are doing in this country and, and all around the world. There's only relatively few scientists directly studying butterflies, but if you think about how many people enjoy seeing them around, if we can get all of them collecting data, then it's a really powerful tool. And in the future, we'll be able to see how butterflies have changed, where they live, where they don't live, how we might be able to help them in the future with more of that data. So yeah, I would say um, get involved with as many of those, those surveys as possible. That would be brilliant. I mean, that links uh, quite nicely, actually, to some of the work that you're doing as well in the museum, doesn't it? That idea of change in butterflies. Do you want to explain the project that you're working on at, at the museum? Definitely. Yeah, so these modern day um, kind of surveys are really important. The most modern data on uh, butterfly numbers and abundances and rain shifts has only really been gathered from the 1970s onwards, which is quite, you know, relatively recent. Obviously, all before that, things were still changing and things were declining or, or spreading or, or changing in number. Um, so one thing that we can do to look uh, into the past is we can use museum collections. So um, when, when we're open to the public, the, the Zoology Museum has a, has a public gallery with maybe six or seven thousand specimens on display. But behind the scenes, we have probably nearer two million specimens actually on site in the Zoology Museum in the stores. So these are things that are behind the scenes to be 
conserved and preserved, but also to have uh, research done on them like, like I do. And they act a bit like time machines because we've got thousands of pinned historical butterfly specimens, some of which are nearly 200 years old. And what this means is I can go into a museum collection and see what lived in the area, in this area or, or in the UK or indeed around the world, nearly 200 years ago and compare it with today. And I can see what changes have occurred. So we have some examples where we have species in the museum, such as the large copper butterfly, which were caught in Cambridgeshire, but they can't be found in Cambridgeshire today. They're actually extinct in the country. And it's a really clear signal from the museum that things have changed. Mm -hmm. And then to my project, basically, it's funded by the Esme Fairburn Collections Fund, which um, funds projects that try to engage people with the messages that museum collections store. And I'm trying to kind of publicize the data stored in this historical butterfly, uh, on these historical butterfly specimens. And make people aware of how much things have changed, how much wildlife has declined, but also ways that they can then support it themselves and things uh, that they can support, like the Wildlife Trust uh, in their local area, which looks after wildlife where they are as well. Fantastic. It sounds fascinating. So I'm going to ask you a few more questions that we've had. We've had a few that are asking how you study butterflies at university and how you become a zoologist. So if you've got any tips on that. That's a really good question too, yeah. Um, I must admit, I've, I've been very lucky. Um, I've been fortunate. Um, but my route into it was I chose a kind of zoology course uh, at undergraduate level. So um, as I said, I was always interested in insects and I knew uh, throughout school that I wanted to do something related to biology and zoology. So I did do biology at A level and then I had a look at the different university courses and I saw, uh, for example, there's one at Cambridge, which is uh, natural sciences. I actually did mine in, in Durham. But natural sciences is a really cool course because it lets you pick subjects from lots of different departments. So I did some geology, I did some uh, biology, I did some anthropology, and it let me really choose my areas of interest, which was great. And then in my final year uh, of that course, I uh, had a project which I got to choose a research topic, and I chose the large blue butterfly, which I'd seen on David Asprey's program. Mm -hmm. And um, that is what really led me to becoming uh, a researcher that looked at butterflies specifically. So I guess my main interest, uh, my main kind of uh, advice for someone wanting to study butterflies is if you do carry that interest through your education and, and you, you choose subjects that you're passionate about, then um, you're kind of on the right track to, to making that uh, your career because people will see that and see that you're interested in it. And if you are really passionate about what you do, it really does make a difference to the people who maybe interview for jobs or that sort of thing. So that would be my main advice. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. Being, having the motivation and doing something you love is really important. So, slight change of question here. Uh, are mm -hmm. there any smelly butterflies? How do, how do butterflies are there any smelly butterflies? Yeah, I mean, I've not really smelt too many. Um, <laughs> I believe there are there are some species that kind of of insect in general that that release secretions and that sort of thing to dissuade predators, and they're very. So it's a good question. They're very smelly to each other. I should probably say that. So um, obviously you'll see that butterflies and moths have um, antennae on the top of their heads, so those little sensory organs, um, which is, they're, they're incredibly sensitive. So one of the things they use these for is to keep track of each other. Because if you imagine a butterfly is generally uh, reasonably small and they might be separated from each other by several kilometers, they've got to figure out where, each, where they are. So often what they can do is they leave kind of, I guess it's an equivalent of a smell behind them, a chemical trace behind them. And it's, it's, they use it in moths a lot as well, where the antennae will pick up that smell and they can, if, if more smell is coming to their right antennae, they'd go right. And if more smell is going on the left antenna, they'll turn left. So they can kind of, using their nose as it were, but their antennae, they can sort of follow where the other butterfly is and eventually track it down. And uh, hopefully then they can mate and lay eggs in the next generation. So yeah, I'm not really sure quite what they smell like to, to humans, but to each other, very smelly. Very yeah. smelly. Very good. Uh, Josh, age seven, asks, which plants should you plant in your garden to attract butterflies? Oh uh, yeah, another really good question. So there's, there's kind of two, two key things you could do there. Um, one thing that butterflies really need, the adult butterflies, is they need a source of nectar. So they need flowers and some of them need flowers throughout the whole year because they live for a really long time like the peacock butterfly with those beautiful eye spots um, so actually there's a great resource I think it's on butterfly conservation where they give you a list 
of different flowers that flower throughout the whole year. And yeah, if you can plant some flowers that uh, blossom in spring, like um, primroses and that sort of thing, and then you have some summer species like lavender, and then some autumn species as well, then uh, that's great because then they have food sources throughout the whole year. Then the other thing that's really good for butterflies is you can plant something that is really good for their caterpillars and their next generation to feed on. And I mentioned in my video, one of the best things, although it might seem a bit strange, one of the best things you can plant in your garden is nettles. Because, yeah. and, and the reason it's a bit strange, obviously they sting, so people don't normally like them in their gardens, but that actually makes them really good for lots of insects because it dissuades larger grazing animals from eating them, so it kind of gives them a bit of protection. And even if just a small patch of nettles somewhere where you're not likely to run into them and get stung um, is, is, is a really good thing that you can have for wildlife. So that would be my, yeah, nettles. They're the, they're okay. the good ones to go for. <laughs> um, so Glennis Patton's daughter is asking, are there any rainbow butterflies? Yes, yeah, so actually this is um, a really good question. The, the one that actually comes to mind is uh, we've got a specimen in the Zoology Museum called the Madagascan Sunset Moth. So it's actually a moth, but if anyone was to look at it, you would think that it was a butterfly um, because it has, as you say, it's got, it's got a beautiful kind of rainbow pattern. It does look like a sunset. It's named really well. Um, and yeah, there's lots of species like that, which, which are a beautiful rainbow color. But I think actually that, even though it's, it's a moth, mm -hmm. not a butterfly, probably is the closest to a rainbow that I can think of. It's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. We've got some specimens on display in the museum. They're stunning. Um, so is he aged seven? Do you know every butterfly in the world? And that's quite a big ask. <laughs> I, I know, that's a lovely question. I, I wish I did. I don't, I'm not even perfect at the ones in the UK. There's a, um, <laughs> um, there's a, as I said in my video, there's about 60 in the UK and some of them look very, very similar. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I'm still learning every day as well. Um, there's maybe 150,000 species of butterfly and moth. Prob um, that we've discovered in the in the world, um, there's more, many more that we haven't discovered. So 150,000 is a lot. I would love to say that I knew them all, but I really don't. Um, <laughs> that's but a that's lot great. Of then there's, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's a, there's a lot more that I, that I have to learn, which is really exciting as well. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, Verity, age six, would like to know what is the best butterfly you've seen this week. Oh, this week. Again, I'm going to have to go with. Um, the peacock butterfly purely because I, I have just seen it and we, we record a little video of uh, the caterpillar turning into a chrysalis which was really really cool mm -hmm. I've not really seen that before and we've got one of those clever cameras which takes a picture every five minutes so you can see it gradually changing but what we didn't realize is how quickly it does it and we've got one picture of a caterpillar and then five minutes later we've got a picture of a chrysalis <laughs> so I, I, don't, I still don't really know what happened <laughs> um, so uh, it's a very cool trait. It spent ages kind of getting in prep and you could see it hanging. It was about to pupate. And, uh, mm -hmm. But then, yeah, clearly it's, it's very quick when it actually okay. does it. So we're going to try again. But um, that's one of the coolest butterflies I've seen. I saw it's caterpillar, but it's one of the coolest yeah. ones I saw this week. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. How long do the oldest butterflies live to? Asks Sam, aged eight. Mm, um, again, there might be longer lived species abroad, but in the UK, the longest lived kind of adult butterflies live abroad about just under a year or so. Mm -hmm. most, uh, most species spend their time, a longer amount of time as a caterpillar or a pupae and it's normally they have a kind of dormant stage over winter when it's too cold to, to go out and feed and then the frost might kill them. They tend to hide away and most species do that usually as a kind of caterpillar or a pupae. But there are a few species of butterfly, things like the peacock uh, butterfly again, which can actually overwinter as an adult and that means that they can, yeah, they can last, you know, nearly up to a year in in that form. So they they are kind of the oldest, yeah, mm -hmm. amongst the oldest in the UK, um, as as an adult butterfly. Yeah, yeah fantastic. So um, this is from Daniela, age four, and this is a really good question: Which butterflies are on the endangered list? Oh yeah, that's uh, a very good question. Um, sadly, uh, butterflies and and lots of other insects aren't aren't doing too well. Uh, at the moment. Um, I should say as well, because butterflies are quite popular, they are sometimes the only group of insects we actually have data on uh, in terms of how, how they have been doing in terms of long-term data and declines and that sort of thing. So generally we use butterflies as an indicator for how other species might be doing as well. So if butterflies aren't doing too well, it can mean that lots of other things aren't doing well either. Um, every five years there's a UK state of butterflies report 
and there's actually one due out this year, but the 2015 one said that 75 or 76 percent of our native and regular migrant butterfly species have declined over the last 50 years. Um, some of the heaviest declines um, are the Duke of Burgundy butterfly, which um, I studied with um, Ed Turner, who was on the show yesterday. Um, and there's the high brown fritillary and the wood white. And some of these butterflies have had huge declines, um, generally because of habitat change and habitat loss for them as well. These, these ones in particular um, generally used to live in kind of woodland habitats or scrubby grasslands. And the change in management of woodlands has meant that a lot of these areas have, have closed up. And uh, sadly, that means that habitat's not as good for them or, or really as abundant for them than these butterflies have also disappeared as well. So those are among some of the, the most at risk. Yeah. So we've got a, a message from Megan. Hi, I was just using iRecord to survey my local nature reserve, saw 70 Ooh. meadow browns. I was wondering wow. if you had any <laughs> tips, there's a lot, if you had any tips for where to find the white ab admiral, I'm desperate to see one. That's Megan, age 18. Oh, that's great. White Admiral. Yeah, so um, the White Admiral is a, a woodland species. So the, the best thing to do, because um, I've done some work with the Wildlife Trust in the, in the past, they have a great um, website where you can have a look at their different wildlife trust reserves. And uh, if you have a look at them, they generally have a species list of kind of uh, interesting species that you can go and see. And they should list there um, what, uh, what butterfly species exist at these different sites. Um, so have a look at some of the woods. I know there's a lot of... Uh, really um, really spectacular woodland species of places like Brampton Wood. I'm not sure if the White Admiral is around them. I would suggest having a look at yeah, the, the Wildlife Trust uh, Reserve site because um, there should be local ones around you pretty much in the entire UK if you're from, from this country. And um, yeah, have a look there. And it's, yeah, it's a woodland species, beautiful. Again, I haven't actually seen one of those either, so I'd like to do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's a really good tip. And, and final couple of tips from you. Um, is there anything you can build to catch caterpillars and butterflies? And how can you identify butterflies through their caterpillars? Yeah, again, okay, so is there anything you can build to, to, catch, cat, uh, to catch butterflies? When we go out in the field to survey them, um, a lot of it is, is done by just kind of look, uh, without catching them by sight. But often, because they can look very similar, some species, you do have to uh, catch them in a butterfly net. So it might be a little tricky to make one. I'm sure you could if you're skilled. Um, but there's some relatively cheap butterfly nets that you can catch. Um, just, be, just be careful with them. Um, I mentioned in the video that they have these, these wing scales, which they can rub off uh, if, you, if you touch them. Um, so what we generally suggest, if you're catching them with a butterfly net, you sort of use the net itself to maneuver the specimen without you touching it. A li if you, losing a few wing scales won't damage them too much, but it's, again, you want to minimize any damage, obviously, to the species mm -hmm. that, you're, that you're observing. And how do I do caterpillars? Yeah, that, they can be a lot harder than uh, the adult, adult butterflies. With the adult butterflies, it is, as I mentioned before, usually kind of say what you see. <laughs> um, but with the caterpillars, it can be tricky. There is a website, I think it's called Wildlife Insight. Yeah, that's right. Um, Wildlife Insight, which has a beautiful list of gallery, uh, galleries of these different pictures of pretty much all the UK caterpillars. So if you uh, um, yeah, find a caterpillar out and about and you take a picture, you and then go to these these galleries and you can see if you can get a match. Okay, great. I've got one last question and this is one I'm asking all of our experts this week. Do you have a top wildlife spot or something that you haven't seen but you would really like to? And we've already mentioned a couple. Yeah, um, I did have some butterfly ones. I'll try and choose a different butterfly one as well. Um, <laughs> Similar, there's, a, there's a really cool butterfly called the, the Purple Emperor. It's got a great name already. Um, but they're, they're absolutely beautiful. They're really large and they, they exist in mature oak woods. And again, it's another species I haven't seen in the UK. But they, they're on the resurgence a little bit after a decline and they're back in Cambridgeshire. And um, again, this is another one which is probably in Brampton Woods, at the Woodwalton Fen and places like that. Again, in the local area, you can probably go and see them. Um, and the, the adults and the, the males have a beautiful kind of iridescent purple colour which shines in the sun yeah. and even if they are in your area you might not have seen them because they stay at the top of these tall oak canopies in, in oak woodlands so they, they're you know, quite rare that you see them and they're, just, they're meant to be pretty spectacular to see so I'd love to, to see one of them at some point. Oh that sounds, yeah I'd love to see one of those by that description, it sounds beautiful. 
Um, thank you so much, Matt. If we didn't get round to answering your question, we've got loads of questions for you. So if we didn't get round to asking your question for Matt, um, don't worry, we will try to answer all of them on our social media. And uh, Matt, you're back with us, aren't you, on Saturday? So yes. another chance to ask him. Be doing more, more insects. Yep. More insects on Saturday. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that. And I'll see you on Thanks. Saturday. Okay, now we're moving on from one group of colourful insects to another, the dragonflies and damselflies, with uh, Duncan McKay. Dragonflies and damselflies can be seen in the summer months above water, where they put on beautiful aerial displays with flashes of colour, as they fly about, catching other insects in the air. In fact, Dragonflies and damselflies spend the majority of their lives living underwater as larvae. Some species spend years like this, whilst the adult form only lives for a couple of weeks. After feeding and growing underwater, the larvae crawl up nearby plants, such as reeds. Here, they shed their skin for a final time and emerge as the adult form. Adult dragonflies and damselflies are primarily concerned with finding a mate and laying eggs. Many species are territorial. The males of species like the scarce chaser dragonfly position themselves on a perch above the water. From here, they can easily take off and fend off intruders to their patch. They do this to protect the best spots for laying eggs and to attract passing females. Since they have aquatic larvae, dragonflies and damselflies live in wet habitats, ranging from lakes and ponds to rivers and fens, like those here in Cambridgeshire. So whilst you're out searching for dragonflies and damselflies, you can see lots of other aquatic wildlife too. Roughly 60 species of dragonfly and damselfly live here in the UK, and many can be quite difficult to tell apart. But there are some simple things to look out for if you're just getting started. The first thing to know is how to tell the difference between a dragonfly and a damselfly. Dragonflies are usually larger and stockier than damselflies. But the main difference is, when resting, Dragonflies hold their wings open. When damselflies rest, they hold their wings closed. Damselflies are also smaller and more delicate than dragonflies. Once you've got the hang of telling your dragonflies from your damselflies, you can account for a few other key features. These will help you sort them into smaller groups, known as families. The largest and longest dragonflies belong to a group called the hawkers. These have very long, thin bodies called abdomens. You can see this here with this emperor dragonfly. Dragonflies with shorter, thicker abdomens belong to a different group. These are called chasers, skimmers and darters. Amongst damselflies, one group are especially easy to identify. These are called demoiselles. Male demoiselles have dark blue-black wings or wing patches, like you can see here on this banded demoiselle. Most other species have transparent wings, so this is an easy way to identify this group. Most damselflies belong to a group containing the red and blue damselflies. You can see their transparent wings here on this large red damselfly. Lots of species of blue damselfly look very similar. The best way to tell them apart is to look at the section of their abdomen just beneath their wings. Small differences in markings here, as well as down the length of their body, can help you to identify them. 
looking at ID guides and pictures is the best way to familiarise yourself with all the different types. Females are harder to tell apart than males, but keep practising and you'll soon be a pro. Dragonflies and damselflies display fascinating behaviours. One of the most interesting things to watch is how they mate. The male clasps the female behind her head, as you can see here. To do this, he uses specialised claspers at the end of his abdomen. Then, the female bends her body round to meet his reproductive organs, and together they form the shape of a ring. This is known as a mating wheel. After the eggs have been fertilised, the males of many species continue to clasp onto the female, and the pair fly away together. The male does this in order to stop competitors from mating with the same female. You can see this happening here as a second male tries to dislodge the male from the female. Some males continue to guard the female until after she has laid her eggs. This helps to ensure that all of the young are his. The female locates a suitable spot for egg laying and probes her abdomen just below the surface of the water, where she deposits her eggs on a plant. You can see here that sometimes the female completely submerges herself, dragging the male along with her in order to reach the perfect egg-laying spot. In other species, like the emperor dragonfly, the male flies away more quickly and the female is left to lay her eggs alone. You can see her doing this here, as she gently probes the end of her abdomen below the water's surface. The next time you visit the water's edge, keep an eye out for these amazing behaviours, and see how many species of dragonfly and damselfly you can spot. I'm now joined by a uh, dragonfly expert, Duncan McKay. Hello, Duncan. Hello there. Hello. I seem to have frozen. You've frozen a little bit, yes. Hopefully it'll all sort itself out in a minute. Um, but okay. one question, we can hear you really well, so hopefully it'll all be fine. Good. Um, one question, first of all, how did you get interested in dragonflies and damselflies in the first place? Well, some time ago, um, the British Dragonfly Society had a, um, oh dear, I'm moving around peculiarly. Um, <laughs> the British Dragonfly Society had a centre at Wick and Fen, uh, and I went and did a course with them. And um, I think it, I think the video is well behind, <laughs> well behind me. Anyway, uh, I went and did a course with them, and uh, they had a very very enthusiastic fellow running the course. Uh, it was about 10 years ago, actually, and uh, I discovered then just how much fun it was to photograph the dragonflies. And uh, so I've been doing it ever since. Oh, fantastic. So we saw some really fascinating biology in your film, and I didn't realise that dragonflies could be so territorial. Um, is that something that's very common? Yeah, I mean, they, they do it all the time. The males, when, when they first emerge, try and find the best spot they can to, um, to call their own territory. They choose areas where, you know, the best egg-laying zone of the pond or, or, or river or whatever it is they're um, occupying is. And, and then other males come along and think, well, oh, this looks pretty good as well, uh, and try and take it away from them and they have these amazing aerial battles uh, and when they flutter their wings against one another and uh, yeah I know it's very very interesting. Fantastic, it seems like your, your film's caught up now with your um, voice so that's brilliant better. as well. <laughs> but the amazing colours of dragonflies and damselflies, what, what's the purpose of it? Because they're so beautiful aren't they, the blues and the greens and the reds. Is it to attract well, a mate? Or? Well, I think that quite a lot to do with it because um, obviously they have to choose 
a mate of the same species. It's no good trying to mate with a, a species that that's not the same. And quite interestingly, last year I actually filmed two dragonflies from different species trying to mate. So they'd obviously made a big mistake. Um, <laughs> But uh, they uh, no, they they so they have to be able to identify each other, and dragonflies have amazing eyes. I mean, you can see on the front of their heads these huge, great big eyes, and we have red. We're able to perceive red, green, and blue, and and then we use those colours to make up the full spectrum that we see. Black uh, dragonflies can have up to thirty different pigments to to see. Um, to see color so they can see often into the ultraviolet and possibly into the infrared as well so they they do actually see things that we don't see um, okay. and their eyes are, are designed um, so that the top half of the eye is very good at seeing contrasty images um, so the light that comes onto the top of their eye often they're looking for prey and it's against a very bright sky so they have one sort of cells on the top and and the, the bottom they're seeing different detail um in, in a sort of less contrasty situation so they're very very um well adapted very clever organisms yeah because that's amazing i find their eyes are just they're so huge aren't they their head just seems to be all eyes when you look at a dragonfly or dancer fly they can amazing. see they can see all around them and sometimes yeah. they land on a stem of grass and and particularly particularly the damselflies are quite thin, so you can't see them. But you could, their two little eyes stick out <laughs> either side of the um, piece of grass, and and they can they can see you from the other side of the grass, even though you perhaps can't see them. Oh, difficult to creep up on a damselfly then. <laughs> yeah. We've, we've yeah, they do yeah. actually. Yeah. yeah. We've got a few questions that have come in. So the first one okay. is the difference between dragonflies and damselflies. Do they belong to the same species? Well, they're different. There are lots of different species of damselflies, mm -hmm. and lots of different species of dragonflies, and the two groups are separate. And, and as the film showed, uh, the dragonflies have to hold their wings out sideways when they're at rest, whereas the damselflies can fold theirs neatly away and, and become much more compact. Um, so, so, yeah, that, that's the main difference. But there are lots of species. Yeah, yeah. Um, Jasper, age five, asks, can dragonflies sting? And no, they can't. <laughs> they, they've got pretty good jaws and they can chop each other up. But I don't think they'll actually hurt humans. They, they, they're too small for that. And they don't sting at all. Okay. So you're all right. You can go and watch them and, and, and not, not feel threatened. Not feel threatened. Um, What's your favourite dragonfly? And it says, this is from your grandson, Hamish, aged one. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, at the moment, uh, my favourite is the Lesser Emperor, which mm -hmm. is quite a rare dragonfly in Britain. But last year, I managed to find one in Cambridge. It's, it's I think, perhaps only the second one that's been found in Cambridge. Yeah. So I was very pleased with that, and I rather like them. <laughs> Uh, Verity, aged... You, <laughs> <laughs> Verity, age six, wants to know why the males leave the females behind when they lay their eggs. Uh, well, I think the males are going off to go and find other females. The, the thing is, they've got, they've got to watch it because um, if they don't hang on to their females, then another male might come along and, and mate with it again and, 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 and then it will be that male's offspring, not not the original one. Um, so they have to watch it. That's why they hang on. They hang on for dear life sometimes. And, and sometimes you get another rival male coming in and buzzing this pair of dragonflies and trying to sort of dislodge the dislodge one. So he's eaten kind of be the father rather than the one that's there already. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, I saw um, some large red damselflies on my garden pond a couple of weeks ago that were doing that and yeah. I was wondering what that behaviour was about. It's really interesting to hear about it. Large um, large reds are lovely. They're the, mm. just about the first damselfly to come out and they're often in lots of ponds so um, people quite quite likely to yeah. see them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, was, I was really chuffed. They were so beautiful. Uh, Megan, aged 18, 
says, Hi Duncan, something unusual happened last year. A massive male emperor dragonfly landed on one of our sunflowers and stayed there for several hours. We're pretty far away from any water source. What do you think caused this behaviour? It's about a 7 to 12 minute walk to the river from our nature reserve. Well, like any species, they have to disperse if they're going to colonise new habitat and, and because in, in one pond, just a few dragonflies can produce more eggs than can possibly be supported by that pond. So the dragonflies want to disperse, they want to find new territory and so probably that emperor was, was on, he could have either been on the way to a new pond or he could be using your garden as a good hunting ground because in his a aerial phase, I mean, he is actually feeding on other insects and it's amazing what they, they do take, quite big things. Um, so he, he and uh, when he's sitting in the sunflower, he may well be getting quite a lot of sunshine and warming his body up because they, they rely on the sun to keep them warm and it's on cold days, they just disappear. They go and hide in the um, undergrowth, but they, they come out as soon as the sun comes out because that's warming their bodies and helping their muscles to work better. Fantastic. That's really, yeah, something I've seen is uh, dragonflies being a long way from the river, so it's interesting to hear why that is. Yeah, I, I was watching Shakespeare in Cambridge last summer uh, on the, um, in the Fellows Garden of King's College and uh, a dragonfly was hunting backwards and forwards across the in front of all these actors and I, I'm afraid I rather missed quite a lot of the play because I was distracted <laughs> by the dragonfly. <laughs> I think I would be too. <laughs> um, yeah. Eloise, age six, would like to know what is the largest dragonfly? Ah, well, in Britain the largest one is the emperor dragonfly and they're fly moment, they're great big dragonflies they have a green, they have green um, thorax um, and a, a sort of blue and uh, green and brown and possibly yellowy body, depending on whether it's male or female. And uh, they're just big and, and, and they are amazing. Wonderful dragonflies. Yeah. Um, how do dragonflies help? the ecosystem? How do they, what do they do in the ecosystem? Well, they are predators. Mm -hmm. So they're kind of at the top of the insect part of the food chain, but they're not the top predator because you quite often see dragonflies being caught by birds. Uh, and um, last summer, I was wandering along in front of the botanical gardens. You know, there's the bit of Hobson's conduit that goes in front of the botanical gardens in Cambridge. And I was watching a pair of mating uh, brown hawkers. And along came a juvenile moorhen, saw them mating, and dived into the water and grabbed one of them and gobbled it up. So that was rather an unfortunate <laughs> ending for them. But uh, yeah. yeah, so they're, f they're, they're food as well as hunters. Yeah. And uh, one last question from our audience. What is the safest way to collect and store? dragonflies and dancerflies? To collect them? Well, mm. I actually photograph them because there's some fantastic cameras now which allow you to take really good photographs. In Victorian times, people used to go out with nets and they used to catch them and then they used to kill them and pin them. But dragonflies are not very good for that. I mean, you've got a wonderful collection of them in, in the Zoology Museum. Going right back, I mean, some of the dragonflies in the Zoology Museum are nearly as old as the nomenclature system. So they are some of the very first dragonflies of that sort. And I, when I came in to have a look, I was absolutely amazed. But, but nowadays, I think the best way is to photograph them. And if you've got a pond in your garden, well, so long as you have emergent vegetation coming out of it, like reeds and things like that, they will come and they will lay their eggs and, and then just watch them because they're just beautiful. They're Very wonderful good. things. <laughs> so I have one last question and I think you may have answered this already, but it's one that I'm asking all of our um, experts this week. 
And that is, do you have a top wildlife spot or is there something that you'd really like to see and you've not been able to yet? Well, one thing about dragonflies is that they are responding to climate change. And all of a sudden we're getting new species arriving in Britain. Um, in Cambridge, 10 years ago, you would never see a willow emerald damselfly. Last September, it was the most common damselfly in Cambridge. So it shows just how quickly things are changing. And what I'm hoping to see is some of the new arrivals because there are some absolutely wonderful things that are coming. I, I'd love to see a Norfolk hawker, which um, is in Norfolk and it's gone to bits of Cambridge, but we haven't quite got it in the city yet. So I'd yeah. like to see that. Okay. Oh, thank you right. so much. Thank you so much for that, Doug. It's been really fascinating. And I um, I liked dragonflies before, but I think I'll look at them with new eyes now. Thank you so much for that. They're fantastic. They're fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> okay, so now it's time for us to set today's challenge. Yesterday, we launched our Zoology Live Wildlife Challenge um, on iRecord. And you can check out our blog for details on how to do that. But today we have a more creative challenge for you. Hello, my name is Sarah and you would usually see me at the Museum of Zoology in Cambridge. While I've been staying safe at home, I've been using bits and pieces from around my house and garden to create small spaces for wildlife. This is our insect hotel. I use an old drawer some glass jars and things like leaves, stones, sticks and bamboo to fill in the crevices. You can find a how-to guide on how to make your own on the Museum of Zoology blog. This week for Zoology Live we are challenging you to make something from recycled materials found around your home such as bottles or card. This is my moth that I created with movable wings or from around your garden or green spaces. So collect things such as leaves or twigs, stones, and see if you can make a collage or sculpture out of what you find. Take a look at our Recycled Makes Challenge page on the blog to find out how you can get involved. We would love to see what you've created, so please do share photos of your creations with us on social media using the hashtag Zoology Live or by emailing them to umzc at zoo.cam.ac.uk. These will be entered into a prize draw to win a wildlife exploration kit on Monday the 29th of June. Your materials can then be recycled or returned back to nature, so we are creating things and helping the planet too. Come to our Zoology Live page on Saturday the 27th of June to see all of the makes, including yours, that have been sent in during the week. Good luck!
Thank you for joining us for today's Zoology Live. If we didn't manage to ask the experts your question, fear not, we will be trying to answer as many as we can in our social media channels. We hope you can join us tomorrow when we'll be looking at pond dipping and wildlife filmmaking, so some really interesting topics there as well. Do remember to add your wildlife sightings to our Zoology Live 2020 event on iRecord. We would love to know what it is you've been finding on your patch. And send any photographs of your makes to us using the hashtag Zoology Live um, on our social media as well. You can find details of how to take part and the rest of the programme for Zoology Live this week on our blog. And we look forward to seeing you tomorrow.